<clears throat> nobody. 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 Nobody rage short stories. Hello, everyone. I'm Megan, and welcome to another exciting episode of Nobody Reads Short Stories, the podcast where we read short stories so you don't have to. You can find all of our previous episodes at our website, which is nobodyreadshortstories.com. So tonight's episode, we are featuring an author that you will recognize. It is My Mother's Eyes by the wonderful and talented Jeremy Ray. So here is Jeff Verge reading My Mother's Eyes by Jeremy Ray. Content warning. This episode discusses suicide. I sigh. My mother isn't in this rendering either. The sketch is technically complete. I could say it is finished. But the eyes. <laughs> the eyes are yet again not my mother's eyes. I erase, making her eyeless once again. That isn't true, she's not eyeless. She is my mother with the many erased eyes. I've tried to draw them so many times. The pencil outlines, though erased, remain. They float about her face like butterflies. No, like ghost eyes of strangers. There, but not there. Just like my mother. I've erased so many times that when I lift the drawing up, the cold white fluorescent light shines through the page like a paper lantern. One, two more attempts, tops, before the paper tears. If my brother weren't here in the hospital room with me, I'd probably cry. I close my eyes and really try to see my mom in my mind. But as always, she's there, but vague. So vague. Her incapacitated body in front of me in the hospital bed is equally useless. Her eyes never open, even if they did. Even if they were open, they wouldn't be her eyes. Yes, this body is her body, but it does everything differently now. The way it breathes, the way it slobbers. Her closed lids may blink as though she were alive, but they are not the motions of Mary Louise. If only she had left behind one picture of herself. No pictures of her on social media, just a bunch of life-affirming quotes. I've scoured my dad's old photo albums, but the handful of pictures of her from a distance or with her hair or hand covering her face, none show her eyes. It's as if she didn't want to be seen or remembered. Why? Add that to the many questions I have for my mom if she ever wakes up. If my stomach turns. At what point did my when she wakes up turn to if? The summer breaks I spent with my very much alive mom have now been replaced with drawings of her that pale in comparison. How many hours have I wasted on my pencil sketches? I don't want to know. Time is running out. Summer break is about to end. My first year of high school's a week away and my mind will be forced to other things and the memories of my mother will fade. I know this because she's already fading. Every moment, every second, she traipses backwards further into the fog. I wanna grab hold, yank her into the light, demand she stay there still, so I can get her eyes right just one time. A tear splatters the page, it was stealthy. I didn't even know I was crying until I heard the splat. Instead of looking down, I glance over to my brother, make sure he hasn't heard as if he could. He is in the hospital room, a few chairs down, leaning in the corner seat, looking like a muscular James Dean. No more tears. I blink rapidly, lower my head so my hair falls like curtains around my face just in case, because my brother can't see me cry. 
My escaped tear wobbles on top of my mom's paper cheek. It looks like a gigantic tear from her. I don't know what to do at first. I watch as her paper skin begins to absorb my tear. In a panic, I dab the breast away with my sleeve. As I look down with my hair still hiding my face, an old, cold remnant of that ninja tear tickles me. It hangs off my chin, dangling with anticipation. I smear it away, thwarting its plans to splatter on the page next to its predecessor. Not that it matters. This drawing, like the others, is a hopeless cause. How many unfinished drawings are there now? 30? I try to disconnect from who they are drawings of as I count, but every page holds a dented, eyeless face of my mother. Each time I move on, I leave behind another eyeless orphan. I am a promise breaker to them and me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All these awards for my art and I can't get a simple drawing of my mother right. What kind of son am I? I should give up, abandon this hobby. And yet, I feel the tug of her in each of the pages. They're all calling to me. This is insane. It's not 30, but 58 incomplete sketches. How many more will there be? I wonder if this is what it is like to have an addiction. Is this an addiction? What if I am trapped in this loop forever? What if I spend the rest of my life chasing her face? I flip back to my current drawing. I grab my pencil. It's a struggle to see her, but her voice inside my head is clear. No. Leave this one behind too. Start anew. I'll be in the next one, I promise. My thumb presses against the pencil. Any more pressure and the pencil will snap. Don't be that way, Jordy. My son's not a quitter. He's a practice. The next one will be perfect. You won't have to erase once. Don't you love me? If you give up, what does that say about your love for me? Keep drawing, Jordy. I don't want to disappear, Jordy. You're my only hope, Jordy. My shoulders slump. But I keep a tight, snap-ready hold on that pencil. With my free hand, I massage my throbbing eyes. I may have won the battle against the Army of Tears, but now my eyeballs hurt. Turn the page, Jordy. Start anew. I don't. I hover the pencil over my last drawing. I have to get this drawing right. Sighing, I angle the pencil back and forth, casting shadows over her eyeless head. If I could just remember her eye shape, their position against her face, how did they angle above her high cheekbones? I move my pencil around, hunting for the right spot. They started here. No, here. Or was it here? If I can get them right one time, I can go back and fill in the others. My heart flutters. I won't just see her again. My brother and dad will too. There will be hope again. I'll hang them up everywhere so that she looks out at us and remembers the home she needs to come back to. <sighs> no, that's childish. That's not how life works. But how good will it be to stop? I'll be able to move on from drawing prepare myself for ninth grade like all the other kids. My mother smelled like roses. This mother smells like stale water. I stare at my supposed mother. The ligature marks around my mother's neck faded months ago. And with it, so did my mom. Replaced by this thing. All of her muscles have atrophied. My mother was always skinny, but now the skin stretches so tightly around her skeleton. Without muscles and fat, she looks like a jagged cliff. Get too close to this thing and she'll cut you. I want to shake this imposter, tell her to bring back my mother. But I can't do that. I disconnect one of the many devices that she's plugged into. So many machines that beep and move. My brother, Brian, Hunches over his chair, staring at her as he stretches his massive back muscles. If I weren't here, 
He'd probably talk to her. Sometimes her heart rate goes up on the device when she hears one of our voices. She does not do this with voices that are unfamiliar. At first, we all took this as a hopeful sign, but then a nurse warned us it doesn't mean she hears us. Our brains are hardwired for speech, and her body might just be instinctually reacting to voices it recognizes. Brian believes she's in there and finds it comforting. I can't get beyond the creepiness of it. Devices spiking when I talk is acknowledgement that whatever it is hears me. I could be talking to a zombie. I rub down the goosebumps on my arms. The creepiness of it is the primary reason I also never visit alone. Brian and I never got along, but this summer has put us further at odds. We see this entity in the hospital bed differently. He wants to be alone with her, but dad always forces him to take me. I'd much rather stay home, but Dad says I'd regret that in the future. Maybe he's right. Maybe. I'm not so sure. I don't feel her here. Ever. It's just a creepy white room with a lot of blinking machines. At least Brian's too self-conscious to talk to the body while I'm in the room. I'm grateful for that. We both sit in silence, listening to the steady rhythm of the electronic devices. As Brian gazes at her, his biceps bulge. He pops his knuckles. He's yearning for something to punch. I do not want that something to be my face, so I always sit in the chair farthest away and closest to the hospital door. He hates my drawings, and this way I'm out of sight and out of mind. While watching him look at her, it hits me like really hits me. He still sees mom there in that bed. I look at her like my brother does. I grab onto the armrests. Something about looking at her through this lens is disorienting. What if I'm imprinting this new version of her into my memory? What if I am painting over the original? I close my eyes and search for her, but she's not there. She's not there. She's not here. Oh, thank God. Parts of her are returning, I, I, I think. But it's not just her eyes that are vague in my memory now. More things are blurred. No, 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 no. How is this possible? It's only been a few months. My mom's not technically dead. How is it possible that I'm forgetting what real mom looks like? We gardened together, sang together, did everything together. Why can't I picture her face? I can't see her clearly in any of those moments. Not anymore. It's because we were always side by side. That's it. Maybe if I had spent less time next to her and more time looking at her from a distance, maybe then I'd see her. It's all my fault. If I were a normal kid with friends, things would be different. I could have come in and out of the house saying, Bye, Mom. Going to so-and-so's. And she could have said, All right, honey. Be back before dinner. She could have smiled at me from a distance, and I would remember her eyes, remember her face, remember her. But I never left the house. I never left her side. Maybe that's why she tried to kill herself. I pinched myself. Stop thinking that way, idiot. She loved you. Loves you. I correct myself. No, loved. She's gone. It's past tense. Her love for me is past tense. I'd be lying if I said I regret any of it. In fact, if I knew this would happen, I would have spent even more time with my mom. The only time we didn't spend together was when she watched her stupid soaps. I regret that. I should have watched those with her too. 
just always seemed weird that a woman so deep could enjoy something so vapid. <laughs> I joked with her that she'd be better off watching reality television. I left her to watch the episodes alone. Once, maybe a year ago, I remember coming out of my room for a glass of water as she watched TV. No matter what tragedy strikes, the story goes on. Life always continues, she said to me. To herself. To the characters. I don't know. Because though she faced the screen, her eyes were not focused on anything in particular. They were distant, almost vacant. As if she were somewhere else. How many other times had I seen that look before? A few. But doesn't everyone drift off from time to time? I'm drifting now. That moment and those words come back to me again and again and again. They're imbued with meaning now. I didn't give those words a second thought then. Just threw ice in my glass and off to my room I went. But at one point, I think those words were wedged around other sentences I can't remember. At one point, they were just another something she said. People say countless things while alive. Life is a string of throwaway sentences. We only select words to take on a profound meaning when circumstances change. We take what happens and hold the pass up to it to see if we can find a connection. Some words we latch on to. We rip sentences out of context and wear them around our necks like amulets. Some go crazy collecting them. My dad wears so many that he stoops from the weight of them. Yep. Words are to haunt the living. My mom would be annoyed that hers are being used out of context in this way. She was a kind good-hearted person. She wouldn't want that for any of us. And yet, what if she knew way back then and left clues? What if she laced her words with secret meaning, hoping one of us loved her enough to find them before she... No matter what tragedy strikes, the story goes on. Life always continues. About a week after my mother hanged herself in her bedroom, I started watching her favorite soap opera, Monstrouses. I felt it was my duty to hate watch it for her while she was away. I say away because I figured I would look at her unconsciousness as a type of vacation away from my father. It was like she was in Hawaii, just a bit less sun. I figured if I could convince myself of this, maybe the universe would make it so. She could return to us super well-rested. <laughs> By that time, she would be desperate to know who was the mother of Killian, the lizard baby, and she would sigh in her sing-song way when she found out what was keeping Teresa from marrying Eric. After three months, I knew the answers to both. Victoria was the mother. She was artificially inseminated by aliens while she vacationed in Mexico. And Teresa can't marry ex... Uh, and Teresa can't marry Eric because the fortune teller said that he would be... And Teresa can't marry Eric because the fortune teller said that he would explode on their wedding day. But holding on to the answers for her soon became painful. As the story progresses, plot lines discontinue, characters disappear. The story might go on, but some characters don't. They're replaced by ones my mother never met. My pointer finger traces my mother's penciled hand. My latest drawing of my mother is better than the predecessors. I've drawn her kneeled over rose bushes. <laughs> She's holding garden shears. Her smiling face turns to peer out beyond the page at whoever is looking at her. Right now, that's me. I use my mother's body in the hospital bed as a model for accuracy and proportion. 
as well as inspiration when and where I can find it. That's becoming more difficult. It's taking more and more imagination. Each hospital visit proves more frustrating. I want to draw the mom I remember, but it's hard to separate that woman from the one in the hospital bed now. They're blending together into a new truth. I gaze at the roses I drew all around her. In real life, without her care, weeds are encroaching her garden beds, sprouting unwelcome flowers. Sure, the bees don't care, but I do. Ripping at these weeds seem to spread them more. Against my will, weeds are also slipping through my memories, sprouting unwelcome flowers. Everything is conglomerating. It's not asking much to have God allow me one drawing of the way she was. One, just one. I blink rapidly to diminish opportunistic tears. I will not let them fall around my brother. To distract myself, I draw dandelions in the rose bushes. Then I erase the smile from my mother's face and make a one-sided lilt as if she's not sure how to feel. I halt, my eyes blur with tears. I'm forced to do a shit ton of blinking to stave them off. The mother in the hospital bed chooses then to cough. Broken veins, discolored skin. With the ventilator and other equipment connected to her, she looks like an alien from her soap opera. I got into trouble a week ago when I sprayed her down with my mother's rose perfume. I admit, I went insane for a second. But she'd hate smelling like this hospital. She smelled like roses, rain or shine, all year round. I wanted her to at least smell like my mom. Maybe part of me also thought something would magically change. Maybe she would use the fragrance like a trail and find her way back to us. I know. <laughs> Stupid. Life isn't a fairy tale. A fairy tale. I flipped to my first drawing of her. Mary Louise was pretty, with her long golden hair, her smooth pale skin. My earliest rendering of her was the most honest. It was the only one I drew of her in her hospital bed with the rope marks around her neck. Interestingly, it was those that made her seem the most alive, like she was just sleeping. As if at any moment, she'd wake up from her slumber. She was the real sleeping beauty waiting for someone to come wake her up. My eye obsession started then. I couldn't draw eyelids on her. It felt like a, a bad omen. So instead, I tried my best to draw them open. But not only were the eyes wrong, they made her look like a corpse. This was the first face I left blank. I moved on 57 more times. Why had I never thought to draw her when she was alive? Or better yet, take pictures. My mom was a magical kind of beautiful. She didn't have movie star good looks. It was something even rarer. She was skinny, almost frail, but guys loved something about her. Maybe it was her pool water eyes. The boys at my school always treated me better when my mom came to the parent-teacher conferences. Suddenly, they were not my bullies, but my best pals. And the dads always went out of their way to say hello to my mom. Each one of them knew her by name. She was gracious about the attention. And when women mistreated her, she handled it as I imagine Princess Grace handled things when she was alive. Unkindness never touched her. It always slipped away like water droplets slide off the back of a swan. It was one of her magical powers. She never seemed quite real. The way she sauntered through the world. It was as if she were an angel tightrope walking between worlds. And her presence in ours was a special gift she shared with me and my brother, my dad, and all who met her. And then she took that gift away from all of us.
no note, no goodbye, no explanation, nothing. I hate you for that, wherever you are. My brain is throbbing. I grab my pencil and rip the eraser out. No more erase marks. Screw open eyes. I'll draw eyelids on this one. All of them. She doesn't deserve effort. She doesn't deserve another one of my thoughts. Throw this notebook in the attic to collect dust. No more drawing. No more art. No more thoughts of mom. I'll move on. She made a choice. Why should I be the one to live with her noose around my neck? My pencil lowers, touches the page. You close them. I'll never come back. I hear the faintest whisper of her in my mind. Lies. This is my voice, not my mom's. My mom would want me to have closure. My pencil hovers over her face. My hand trembles. Closing her eyes will give her peace. I didn't raise my son to give up. Fine, I'll play along. What do you call hanging yourself in a bedroom? I say in my mind to the imagined voice. Point taken. But you're not me, Jordy. Go beyond me. Show me what you're capable of. Capable of? The mouse. Turn to the drawing of the mouse. Confluence. Somewhere before all my mother drawings is one of a dead mouse. But to turn back to it means turning back to a time when my mother was alive. Please. No. No more demands. Come back and turn the page yourself. But I want to show you something in that drawing, Jordy. I don't flip back. I haven't looked back at it since you left. I called the dead mouse and the drawing confluence. It's my favorite, Jordy. Yes, yes, I know that. Brian always thought my pictures of dead things disturbing. Brian always thought my pictures of dead things disturbing. And now I sort of agree, even though I don't tell him that. But back then, I thought it was my duty to memorialize life before death took it away. Mom always liked my drawings. She'd wink at me, a mischievous glint in her eyes. Anytime Brian made one of his inane comments, the spark on them gave me, I don't know, a kind of confidence. Her favorite was my drawing of confluence. She called it a masterpiece. I drew its little dead body curled up inside of one of my mom's flower pots as if it were asleep. It was one of the lucky mice that died a quick death in the mouth of our dog. Hugo, our fluffy, adorable miniature poodle terrier mix, looked all cuddly on the outside. He loved giving people kisses. But Hugo had a dirty secret. He was a serial killer. More brutal than Ted Bundy. He found new prey every week. Quick death was a blessing to his helpless victims. The days Hugo felt extra bloodthirsty, he would keep the rodents alive and squeaking. He was very cat-like in how he toyed with his victims. Sometimes Brian or I would stumble upon the struggle just in time and could release the victim from the jaws of Hugo. We would set it free to live another day. But most of the time they were dead, or worse, in agony, begging for death to take them. Brian was a horrible brother, but I guess I could give him that he was always a decent human being. He would pick up the mice, squirrels, and rabbits, place them in a comfortable surrounding, cover them up put them out of their misery with a hammer. It sounds brutal, but it had to be done. Afterward, he'd go to his room, put on some loud music, and the smell of pot would travel down the hallway to my bedroom. You gave him peace, my mother had said to me when she looked at Confluence. You've done right by him. I have such a talented son. I liked my drawings back then because of how much she admired them. I wonder how I would feel if I looked at Confluence now. Probably would hate it. Drawings are embellishments for truths we can't handle. Drawings are lies we tell ourselves. 
I continued checking in on that mouse's body. I kept it in the flower pot where I morbidly observed as time took it away. From maggots popping through the mouse's eyes to fungus sprouting over the mouse's fur, death claimed its prize. My brother and dad demanded I throw confluence away. You'd be surprised at how something so small can reek. I told them I'd bury it out back. Instead, I took it behind the house and checked on it daily, hovered over it with pinched nose and watched bubbling gas distort the tiny corpse's shape. After a few weeks, there was nothing left of the mouse except pelt and bones. Your sketch remembers, my mother had said one early morning as I crouched over his body. It was still dark. The morning Missouri sky was only beginning to bleed with daylight. I thought everyone was still sleeping and I was alone. I sprang up as if caught in a crime. But her eyes weren't on me. She stared down into the flower pot as if it were enchanted. That little mouse will go on existing because you cared enough to immortalize it. She said as she stood there barefoot, her nightgown blowing in the wind. Then she turns to me. My mom stares at me so deeply. Her eyes beam like tiny suns. The warmth they radiate warms me. The crinkles around her eyes spread out from her face like rays. I miss those eyes so very much. I miss her. Her long blonde hair blows like a flame in the wind as she smiles at me. For a moment, she's so real, I can almost touch her. Shh. I think I relive the memory of the wind, but then I realize it's a sigh. I'm in the hospital. It's my brother's sigh. He stares at our mother's glacial body. And again, I can't quite remember her. Again, she is gone. Brian is the good-looking son. He has my R, mother's complexion, but our dad's angular features. Girls like him terribly. I think it's because they think he is mysterious. It's impossible to discern what he's feeling. His face is so unexpressive. It still is. But this summer has left him raw, exposed. He doesn't need to show emotions. They linger there, close to the surface. As Brian gazes at her, his jaw flexes and tightens the same way it does when he's emotionally preparing to put one of Hugo's victims out of its misery. I place my pencil in my mouth. I'm tempted to flip my sketchbook to a new page and capture this moment. Draw Brian at his most vulnerable. Sure, Brian will obliterate me if he notices, but the risk might be worth it. There's something likable about the jerk when he has my mother's softness. My mother's softness. Brian, where do you think she is? I ask. Hmm? Brian looks over vaguely in my direction, but the moment he realizes it's me who spoke, he breaks, stops before eye contact is made. His jaw flexes as he grits his teeth. He has forgotten he's not alone in this room, and I've reminded him. Damn it. I would have gotten away with a quick sketch. She's right there, you idiot. He turns back to her, once again forgetting my existence. I'm numb to his words, but I want them to hurt. I prod my tongue with an incisor, experiencing the dull pain of its sharpness. Suddenly, my mouth opens against my will again. Mom is trapped somewhere, I say. It just comes out. I didn't even know it was a thought. There's a silence as we both seem to take in that possibility. Brian rolls his eyes as if that's stupid. Because it is stupid. What made me say it? Do I believe that? That maybe she's caught somewhere between life and death? For a moment, I picture death trying to seal her away and life tugging back. Is it like that? A game of tug of war? 
are life and death fighting over her? Or is the body before us a bridge between two worlds? If so, what side will she choose? Unlike the mouse, her body will not disappear. The machines, the technology, could keep this makeshift mother alive, indefinitely. But science is not to blame. We are. We're not ready for death to have my mother as its prize. My family waits and, against our wills, hopes for her return. I wonder, are we all haunted by that voice that pretends to be her? The one that whispers, almost there. Don't leave me. Almost there. Is that why my dad hasn't pulled the plug? And what will happen if we do? Will the voice start to say things like, I would have come back had you waited just a second longer? Probably. Her voice in my head rouses. Draw me again, Jordy. It'll be the one. And when you complete it, I will return. An empty promise, I know. But it still tugs at me. I know that even if I completed a drawing, she would not return. The voice would find something else I had to do. I'm a slave to the voice. And I know wherever I go, no matter how far I travel, the voice will follow. It'll jab at me like a pebble in a shoe, one I'll never be able to remove. You're wrong, Jordy. You'll see. Draw me just one more time. It'll be the one. You'll draw my eyes and you'll see. You'll see, Jordy. Brian's backpack hits me in the head as he walks by. His car keys jingle. If you leave me, you'll lose the drawing you would have completed, Jordy. I'm not ready to go yet, I say. If Brian hears my words, he doesn't acknowledge them. Brian opens the hospital door only enough so that he's able to muscle through. He wants the resistance. He wants the door to oppose him, but his broad shoulders thrust at a jar and it swings open, no match for his power. I said what? He pulls the door shut behind him, and it silences me. I know him. It's a challenge. He's baiting me. He's daring me to follow him, to say something that will give him permission to pummel me. I know better. I know better, but I open the door and follow him anyway. Brian is much farther down the hall than I expected. I was wrong. He's wanting to leave me behind. Hey! He doesn't turn. It's as if he doesn't hear me. I wonder if our mother's shouting at us too and we don't hear her please bouncing off of the hospital walls. Brian! He's leaving us behind, Jordy. You're like me, Jordy. Just like me. Brian, wait up, please! No hesitation from him. He doesn't hear me. I'm a ghost he's leaving behind. This is a hospital, the land of the dead. How many unheard screams bounce off of the sterile white walls? Answer me, you prick! He swings the door open and is gone. He's abandoned me in the hospital. I don't want to be alone in the hospital of the dead. See? What did I tell you? You're invisible like me, Jordy. I book it down the hall. I need to get to him before he leaves me behind. I imagine him going down the cement stairs. I see it so clearly, him heading to the car. I sprint harder. I feel so many eyes watching me. For a moment, I'm relieved to be seen. But then I imagine they're the eyes of the dead and I'm too scared to look at the eyes to confirm whose they are. I'm about to be trapped here with ghost eyes. I bump into a woman. She can't be dead or we wouldn't feel each other's impact, would we? We both nearly fall over, but I catch myself. Are you okay? She seems concerned, but I will not reply to a potential ghost. My eyes remain on the closed hospital door. I pull her hand off my shoulder and I sprint. The sound disappears. He surely made it to his car by now. He's getting in. 
He's putting the key into the ignition. He's driving away. If I can get out fast enough, maybe I can catch him in the parking lot before he turns. I distinctly see him turning the blinkers as he tries to merge into traffic. I push at the door, but it doesn't budge. Ghosts can't open doors, Jordy. I was the only one who saw you, and now that I'm gone, that is what you are, Jordy. A ghost. I scream. The scream is for me to put my voice into the world, make sure I still exist. Ghosts can hear themselves, Jordy. But ghosts can't open doors, Jordy. I try the door again, but it won't open. Then I see it. Someone's holding the door closed on me. Not just anyone. Brian. He sees me. Thank God he sees me. His eyes bore into me. They narrow on the other side of the door window. A challenge. I take a step back and make a lunge for it. The door doesn't move. He smiles. Fucking quarterback. Fucking bully. Forget about him. Stay here with me forever, Jordy. Let me out, you jerk! I hear in my voice that I'm crying in front of my brother. I have lost and he has won. I slap the glass, wishing I could get through to his face. He presses that face into the glass. It spreads across, resembling a snarling bulldog. He's daring me to punch the glass, break it into pieces. And I wind up to do just that. Hey! This isn't a playground! A doctor or a man who looks like one says. They're all watching us. Patients and hospital staff alike. All with the same look of irritation. They're making judgments about us. What brats? That's what they're thinking. I feel the burn of their laser eyes. I want to tell them to stop staring at me, but my lips do nothing but quiver. The hospital door swings open. Brian holds it open. He leers back at each one of them, daring them to keep staring. What are you looking at, huh? His face turns red. We're just having a little fun. You know, because our mom's in a coma. Fucking assholes. I don't like Brian, but I dislike them more. They return to their conversations as if we never happened. Brian extends a hand in my direction, gesturing politely like a hotel lobby attendant beckoning a patron through. I do. I walk through. I know it's for show, but I'd rather be out here with him than in there with them. He's so fucking red. I'm sure he's going to pull me behind the bushes, beat me up where no one can see, but instead, he climbs down the cement steps, hands in his pockets. What kind of person draws his mom in a hospital bed? He asks it casually as if he really wants to know the answer. You wouldn't understand, I say. He sighs. No, I suppose I wouldn't. I'm not a creep. It isn't his words, but how he says them that sends me over the edge. He's called me a creep many times before. My brother's favorite pastime has always been getting a rise out of me. But for the first time, there is no tension behind his words. It's a statement, a truth, a conclusion he's finally come to after all these years. A creep is what I am. What an arrogant prick. With such an arrogant know-it-all face. How blithely he climbs down the steps. It's stupid taking on a muscle-ridden brother but the notebook flies out of my hand so easily. It's an involuntary spasm, an involuntary spasm with perfect aim. My notebook hits Brian square in the back of the head. It feels good hearing the smack of my notebook meeting his skull. Not so good watching my brother topple down the flight of cement steps and downright awful when he is at the bottom unmoving. Brian? I squeak. He doesn't answer. Brian, are you okay? Nothing. I'm less worried about his well-being and more about my own. 
If Brian doesn't get up, I'll have to explain to dad why another family member is at the hospital in a coma. I poke Brian with my shoe. He grimaces. Jordy? Oh, thank God he's alive. Yeah? I say casually. Run. This is the only time I've ever listened to my brother. I grab my notebook and the keys and run. I don't have to look back to know Brian is just fine. I can hear him rhythmically breathing as he chases. Running is hard. I should join the track team. Running is hard. I should join the track team. I think as I gasp for air. It's terrifying running away from a giant. Maybe it's my mind playing tricks on me, but the ground quakes like Godzilla on the hunt. But I'm going to make it. I press the fob on the chain and the car blinks and beeps as if saying, get in. Brian's right behind me. His short rhythmic breaths are on my neck. It sounds as though he's stabbing the air with a knife. Only a few more steps. Then I can lock myself in. I'll be safe. Maybe I'll illegally drive myself home. Ha! That'll show him. Suddenly, I feel a kick to the back of my knee. I fall to the pavement. I skin open both my hands as I collide with the asphalt. My notebook skitters and slides under the car. Brian grabs me and turns me around to face him. His sweat trickles onto my face as he seethes. This is it. He raises his fist and his giant bicep flexes. If he releases his fury, I will have a broken skull. Brian, please don't kill me, okay? I'm sorry, I, I just don't like it when you call me a creep. His fist remains in the air. He stares below the car. Bring me the notebook. Brian, please, no. You don't want to be a creep? Then bring me your notebook. Brian, you, you don't understand. Five. Four. Three. As much as I fear the blow, I don't budge. Let him kill me. I won't let him destroy what I have left of my mother. You have your way of dealing. I have mine. For the last time, she's not gone. Then where is she? In that hospital, you idiot. Maybe you're believing that keeps her from coming back. He lets his fist hit me with full force, but he has recalibrated his aim so it hits my stomach. You're delusional. I yell up at him defiantly as I cough and sputter. That's not mom. He punches me repeatedly. That's not our fucking mother. His punches hurt, but I know from his face that I am delivering blows of my own. She'd still be here if you found her five minutes earlier. It's all your fault. I hear a loud crash. I don't associate it with thunder. I associate it with my blow. He shakes from my words. He gasps as they strike him. With the sound of more thunder, his whole body goes limp. He falls over and hits the pavement. He's making a strange wheezing sound. And for a moment, I think maybe he's been hit by actual lightning. Then I realize he's crying. I've never heard him cry before. I realize what a strange sound it is. This should feel like the ultimate victory, but it is the ultimate defeat. He's supposed to be the strong one. Brian. Hey, Brian. Get up. He does not. The world darkens. I look up at volumes and volumes of dark clouds. I glance over at the notebook under the car, but decide Brian is more important. Brian, come on. <gasps> You're right. His face is buried in the road. <gasps> Five more minutes earlier and she, and she. I crawl on top of him and feel all the muscles of his back quake as he howls. You saved her life if you hadn't done CPR. What good did that do, huh? I mean, where the fuck is she? 
I open my mouth, but before I say anything, there's a breeze. A soft, gentle breeze that sighs in a sing-song way, almost like... Brian and I both go silent. Neither of us moves. There's the scent of roses all around us. I look around, but see no rose bushes. Brian? He lifts his head, wipes his tears, and nods. He feels her there, too. We say nothing. The wind tousles my brother's hair about almost playfully. It seems as though the wind will go on forever, but as suddenly as it comes, it's gone. So is the smell of roses. Brian stands. He says nothing, but I can see it in his eyes. He helps me off the ground. We walk to the car, but I look back. I look back at the hospital. Come on, let's go home, Jordy. Brian hides his red face from me as he gets into the car. And I take a little longer getting my notebook so he will have time to stifle his tears. We can pretend his crying never happened. I make a special point to sit myself in the back of Brian's car with his smelly pile of gym clothes. We both need a moment to ourselves. We both need space to war with our tears. Open the notebook, Jordy. Show me confluence. There's a warmth to the voice this time. Okay. I open my notebook and turn past all the mums without eyes. I open to confluence and shudder. The drawing is how I remember it, but in the corner, there's something. In my mom's hand is written, I love you so much, Jordy. Next to the writing is a thumbprint made of dirt. Her thumbprint. She must have written this while gardening. <laughs> My thumb fits into hers so neatly. I cry, but it's somehow okay because I hear my brother doing the same in the front seat. A warmth travels up my spine like when you receive the warmest of hugs, ones only moms can give. My brother cries louder. Did he get one too? Are you here with us inside this car? I don't know if that would make me happy or sad. But I promise no matter what the answer is, I'll keep drawing you, Mom, for the rest of my life. I know you don't expect that from me. It's what I want. I love you so much, Mom. I may never find your eyes, but you exist as long as we remember, and I want to remember. Oh, Jeff, that was such an amazing read. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So for everyone who wants to know, Jeff is an actor, screenwriter, and peanut butter addict based in Los Angeles. He's recently come off of a strong supporting role for the upcoming indie feature film, Glasses. You can hear more of his voice over work as your personal fitness trainer on the Down Dog HIIT and Down Dog Running apps, which are available in any app store. And you can follow his journey on Instagram at Jeff underscore Verge. That is B-E-R-G-E. -E. Thank you again for such a wonderful reading, Jeff. We really appreciate your time. Of course. Thank you, Megan. So now it's time to bring on our special guest for this evening. I'm so excited to have with us Alexandra Speed. She is a writer, a wonderful writer and director whom I've known for quite some time now. I'll read you her bio. Uh, Alexandra Spieth is a writer and director from Brooklyn. She recently wrote and starred in the BRIC TV's original series, 86th, and the original series, Blank My Life, which spans four seasons. It's one of my personal favorites. This year, Alexandra began the festival circuit with her written and directed horror comedy debut feature, Stag. I'll read you the logline. 
A loner must fight for a second chance at redemption when she is invited to her estranged BFF's bachelor party. Stag is screened at the Brooklyn Film Festival, Female Eye Film Festival, where it was the winner of Best Thrills and Chills, and Portland Horror Film Festival. Stag will also be playing at the Genre Blast Film Festival in Winchester, Virginia, and in October at the Portland Film Festival. So uh, without further ado, here is Alexandra Spieth. Hi, thanks Hi. for having me. Welcome, Alex. I'm so excited. Oh my God, I'm so excited. That was <laughs> so, so awesome. It was so great. Such a good reading, such a good story. Uh, I know. Wasn't Jeff amazing? Yes, yeah, so good. Okay, before we get into it, though, I've got a crank cranky. Okay, so cool. bring it out cranky. For those of you who are listening, you'll know that I have this giant alarm clock that I'm now cranking to three minutes. And we're going to set it up here so that we don't jabber on for too long. Because mm -hmm. um, we have lots of nice things to say about that. Mm -hmm. I love this. This is one of my favorite stories of, of Jeremy's. Um, and I think one of the things that I love so much about it is just how like present you are with this character. I was thinking about it when I was listening to Jeff's story. I just feel like even though Jordy's not doing anything, he's just sitting there watching his mom. I kind of feel like I'm on the edge of my seat, though. Absolutely. I mean, I do think it's like, I mean, uh, Jeremy's writing is always like lurid and super like tapped in. But I definitely think there's a lot of like kid vision in the piece. Mm -hmm. It's like super cool. And like, I, I don't know. I mean, I was like, I was so interested in the relationship, like, because it's like all these people are kind of existing, like not in purgatory, but in this like, like wake like in a waking weird state where it's like all of them are sort of in the same place that like the mom is kind of. right oh that's yeah. such a good point i love that but it's so true and having been through like my own experience of having a parent in the hospital i mm -hmm. i feel i felt that so real where where you don't when you're in that limbo of like you don't know what's going to happen to your loved one mm -hmm. you, you do feel that where you're like this isn't real life. This is, some, yeah. you know, this is some strange other world that I'm existing in. Totally. And like the pro, I mean, I was super interested in the protagonist's like disassociation of being mm -hmm. like this woman, like, mm -hmm. isn't my mom anymore, which I, I like, I mean, obviously people totally feel that way, but I do think it's a cool, like, you know, it's such a cool counterpoint to Brian who's like, no, of course this is like, this is still the existence like we're still operating in the past where it's sort of like the protagonist is more like, hey, we're, but we're like, you know, now the case, the situation has changed. Oh. oh my God, that was so quick. That was so quick. Oh my gosh. We could just go, oh. that's why we, that's why we have a, a timer because wow. otherwise we just go on and on and on and on. Um, But please finish your thought. Oh no, I mean, I was just going to say, yeah, it's a good, I mean, I think it's such a cool contrast to Brian who is, what I was going to say is I love Brian. I love Brian. I love that character. I think it's so cool that he's in the story. Oh, ab absolutely. And I think he's needed to, to mm -hmm. help us to ground it and to, totally. to sort of pop us out of that, that, that otherworldly state that you talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, well, great. Okay. So let's bring on Jeremy, but before we do, let's uh, tell everyone how amazing he is. So everybody knows Jeremy from our, our previous seasons and how, how wonderful he is. But now I'm going to tell you uh, even more wonderful things about him. So Jeremy Ray graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with an MFA in dramatic writing. He is the recipient of the Max K. Lerner Playwriting Fellowship for his play Boiling Point and the Schubert Playwriting Fellowship for his play Sisters of Transformation. His work has been performed at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, and his screenplays have placed in the Page International Screenwriting Awards competition, the Academy Nichols Fellowship, and the Screen, Cra Screen Craft Drama Contest. And I got on to Jeremy for this. He doesn't even mention his prose in his bio. And so I also just wanna say that Jeremy has many, many um, prose accolades. Uh, this is not his first his first time into any sort of um, exhibition of his prose work. So let's bring on Jeremy Ray. Yeah. Oh, man. 
Uh, Welcome, Jeremy. Wait, can we can we brag about Alex now, please? Like <laughs> we no. We no, already we have bragged to. about Alex. No, I've been waiting for that <laughs> moment. So I am hoping, I request that nobody reads has the link to uh Blink My Life. I it, that's the title, right? Blink My Life. Wait, of the series I made? Yeah, of course. Series. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So that and also the trailer that you have at the end of your your email thing. Yeah. I, I want there to be a link of that too. Alex is so good. So my first <laughs> moment with Alex, Alex, I still remember my first moment where I was like, I'm in love with her. You okay, came wait, stage. wait. So let's let's tell everybody that all three of us went to oh, Carnegie okay. Mellon University I thought I was gonna get together. Trouble. <laughs> just so everybody has some context. That's why we're like in love with each other. Totally. Um, Alex, Alex was an experience. actress. She was an actress at Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't know at the time that she was going to be a brilliant writer, director, oh producer, everything. Um, yeah. Anyway, so she, everyone's pretty and awesome and talented, doing their monologues. Alex comes on. Hold on. Oh my God, she's messing around. She's doing her monologue. Paper. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Oh my god. That's Jeremy, what she did in the monologue. Jeremy is ripping up paper, which oh is my like god, that's what she did. Yeah, and she just it's killed baby. the monologue. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna use her. <laughs> so sweet. Oh my god. That's so but you, funny. But you should really check out her work because not is she, not only is she a great, great, great performer, but like she's a great writer and director for sure. Thank you. You're the I, best. You are all I, the best. 100% agree. I mean, the whole time we were in school together, Alex was like hiding her her fantastic um, writing and directing skills. And um, we are so pleased that she finally let all of that out and is thank beating you. it. So, okay. Thank you, Jeremy, for yes, giving us the you, time to, like, you, gush, <laughs> to gush over Alex and how fantastic she is. I'm but so this grateful. is this is your episode, and so we have to talk about you. I know, so I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about, and I want to talk about Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alex and I both want to ask you questions, though. Um, Fine. So... I would like to know, Jeremy, uh, where did you get the inspiration for this story? I know you, that you get a lot of your stories from dreams or from, you know, things that just kind of pop into your head. So can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah. So I have a background in playwriting and screenwriting, mm -hmm. and I had an idea for a series and it was like a series of novels and I didn't know if I would be able to write prose. Mm -hmm. So at the time, Megan and I were in a lovely group, like a Studio Cities writers group. And I was like, uh, well, I wrote part of this, so I'm just gonna bring in something, but I wanted it to be like its own little thing. And so I just adapted it from my series. And I just wanted people to tell me if I should keep trying to write prose or not. And yeah, it, the, the response was good. And then I just kept reworking it and everything. Uh, so that's what happened. Like, I mean, that was my first experience and it was scary because like at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. going back to Carnegie Mellon, like it is in us to do the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And this piece does not do that at all. Like it's stream yeah. of consciousness, it's first person, it's present. And I'm like, oh boy, I do not like any of this. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting challenge because even prose doesn't usually like hit those things so it 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 was an awesome source of practice i guess did i answer the question i forgot the um question. no you didn't actually i i kind of wanted to know like how did you come how did you meet the characters of jordy with like watching his mom and like the brother with brian like how did you or, or what was the process like for you to like find these characters and write their story well i the characters were in the series. So I just mm. took a little piece. Maybe I wasn't clear on that. I took a little okay. piece of mm -hmm. the series. And it's almost like a, not literally, because this is very confusing talking about story and saying this, but it's like an alternate version, right? Like mm -hmm. my series has a mother going through the same thing that this character does. But mm. like the series, they have different names. They're different characters in the same situation. Mm. And I just made this so that it would be 
help me finish the words, guys. Like, just like a complete little story where. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I just adapted it into mm -hmm. that. Did I answer the question now? Yes. Oh, yes. I love when I can answer a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think you totally, totally like, I mean, I thought it was very, very cool. That sort of like circular prose. Mm -hmm. It like reminds me of like, you know, Virginia. It's such a, yeah, it's super, super cool. So I guess like, what, uh, how did you identify with the protagonist or like, why did you decide it to be this sort of like young person? Why, like what, what drew you to, to the protagonist? Uh, I, I get his sensitivity. Yeah. Like I thought it was really interesting and scary to put myself kind of in his situation like mm -hmm. the whole idea i mean it, okay so we're all writers here it's very yeah. weird when it's not you like it's not you when something pops up like having a mother in a hospital like where did that come from right mm -hmm. like it's like something happens like your subconscious pulls it up or god or the higher self or, or universe or whatever and it's there and you're like well that's curious let's just explore that thanks for giving that to me and we'll we'll see what happens and um, I guess I really cared about him because he's so weird. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all his thoughts mainly. And, um, a lot of times my protagonists, they push me in uncomfortable ways. Mm -hmm. For me, it was really uncomfortable having, having someone his age that speaks so well, mm -hmm. like, so like that was something where I was thinking about the audience in the future and they're going to be like, no, no kid that age would talk that way. And I'm like, he does like, mm -hmm. that's what I sent. So he scared me. And so I just kept pursuing that voice and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I really loved Jordy's voice and I loved being inside his head. And, and as I, as I mentioned, when Alex and I were talking, even though he's not doing anything. I feel like there's such a dramatic rhythm to being inside of his head and the way that you, you move us through his thoughts and the way he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't tell us until much later what happened with his mom. And it's like, mm -hmm. he doesn't want to think about that. And so he can't just come out and think about it. You know, when you're, when you have to think about something really awful, sometimes it's this circuitous, sort yeah, of motion that you have to go to yeah a whirlpool before you can actually get to that point where you're like okay now i have to think about this or i have to process it and i think that's where a lot of the drama comes from this is how jordy is navigating his thoughts and yes he's young but i, I found it very believable and i didn't mm -hmm. i didn't question jordy's ability to analyze what's happening to him because I think sometimes we think that children and teenagers can't process things or they don't have the autonomy to process their emotions. And we, we need to give them that space to do it. If you give them the time and you give them the space to do it with like, like any other human being, they, they can do it. Um, but I, I just, I just think you did that so well and that it, that it really pulls the the reader and the listener along in a very skillful way. Like I felt very safe in your hands. Oh, totally. Like, I don't know, I just reread The Giver. And obviously that's like completely different because, you know, this is first person and, you know, it's just like, a, it's a completely different sort of character. But mm -hmm. I was like, I was shocked, like rereading it, how elevated that mm -hmm. like text uh. is. It's it's way more like antiseptic. Like yours is way more like- mm -hmm. your That's kind of, such like, a good word, Alex. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it Man is. is the whole thing what it's about is like, there's no I color. Love that word. But yeah, I mean, I, I it reminded me of that where I was like, yeah, it's like, it's an elevation of- Elevation, of course. Yeah, so. but mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't not, I bought it. Like I was like, a kid could feel this way for sure. It's just- you know, the, the writer that <laughs> provides the jungle gym, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. Like there are different, like looking at different texts that are written from a young people's point of view, whether it's YA or children, like there are these different styles and sometimes like you're able to interact with them just in different ways and, and however access 
the right the author is giving you to this to this child or to this this young person and sometimes it's very elevated and sometimes it's like you know purposefully written in this sort of higher brow sort of totally. language and then sometimes you're like in the deep like yeah. you are with Jordy. No, <laughs> Oh, that's it. Do you, um, Jeremy, do you think that Brian is the antagonist in this story? No, no. I think the antagonist is not a human in this piece. The antagonist is the not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. No, Brian, Brian is a very valid way of dealing with grief as well. So mm -hmm. those two people Absolutely. are there to show that like those are both valid ways to express grief. Mm -hmm. um, and of course they don't see it that way, right? Because they're dealing with this moment where they don't know what's gonna happen. Um, mm -hmm. But no, he's not the antagonist. Yeah, I love that. I love that the not knowing is, is the antagonist and um, the thing that's sort of forcing them to deal with the situation because they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, I love that there is Brian in this story that we do get to see that other side of grief and the other side of what this experience, how this experience is affecting this family. And one of the things that I, that I loved about this reading is like the dad really came out to me mm -hmm. in this reading in a way that I, that I hadn't really thought of the dad much. I mean, he's such a, he's such a tertiary character mm -hmm. and he's only mentioned a few times, but it's, it's poignant to me that the dad is not in the, ho in the hospital room, that the mm -hmm. dad is not physically present with his sons when all of this is going down. And, the weight of that and and it made me think of his own grief and like he must be going through mm -hmm. at this time and, and so even though he's not physically in the room with them i still thought of him as being like a part of this sort of grief that's hovering over this entire family and i thought that again that just shows your 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 craft and and your ability to to keep all of that going um within the story very very well done it totally Oh, it's sorry, interesting. No, you go, Jerry. <laughs> oh, sorry, Alex. Um, it's interesting you say that because, like, one of the notes I got when we brought in to writers group, they were like, "We need the dad. We need oh. him in this hospital room." And I'm like, "No, no, that's not the story." <laughs> yeah. Well, just because your audience asks for something doesn't mean you should always give it to them. <laughs> no. Well, they're not my audience. They're 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 badass writers with great opinions that I just didn't happen to want this particular one. So right, right. Yeah. Wow. Totally. Yeah, I was gonna say, like I the way I read it, obviously you you win because you are the writer of this story. <laughs> I like I read it where I was like the antagonist, honestly, it felt like to me was the mom. Even mm. though it, like, obviously there's so much like love and like can't like it's not that you know I felt like she was hated. But I was like, but it's the same thing as the unknowing. It's like, you don't know whether she's still mom or like whether she's not anymore. And it's like the fact that the like they're all feeling such culpability. And even the fact that the dad like can't come to the hospital, it's like, he and I mean, she tried to commit suicide. Like, I'm sure he's like, you know, really like that made a lot of sense to me that it was like, he makes his son go, but like he can't um be there okay mm -hmm. and with that in mind with all of these very uh, like intense topics what was the hardest part of this to write for you and was it something that wasn't emotionally deep at all was it like the intro or something no um this one this one was really hard for me to write yeah because uh i got in my own head like i, I mm -hmm. hope there's a lot of writers listening to this but when we do something different, like there's the fear that it's bad just because it's different. So to answer your question, uh, his Jordy's voice, like mm -hmm. his elevated voice scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, this is gonna get judged. Like I'm judging it, right? So mm -hmm. that scared the shit out of me. And then the the style, like, like it is stream of conscious. So it's the whirlpool, right? He'll go back in a loop, right? It's not going mm -hmm. forward like with action, like, that's like what we fear, right? Is like not making an active piece. Mm -hmm. So those were my two things that they scared the crap out of me. 
Mm -hmm. And um, there was a moment where I was like, I'm not publishing this. This is not, <laughs> this is not happening. And legit, I did not want to publish it. And then my mom, who rarely reads my stuff, said, I really like this. Like, you should publish it. And I was oh. like, oh my gosh, my mom actually likes this. Okay, at least one person likes this. I'll, I'll publish it. <laughs> so, yeah. That's oh. awesome. I mean, that's, that's so sweet. <laughs> so great. I, I love that. I mean, kudos to your mom for, like, making you put it out there. Because I think it's, a, it's just such a great story. It's not something that you need to, like, hide from. I think the things that we that scare it's us are the things we us. need. It's the vulnerability thing. Yeah. You know that that's what's going to like help you like be a <laughs> color, but you're like, but do I have to do it? <laughs> yeah. Like, no. Wait, I know. It's like, we, no. Megan, uh, this is your show. Can I talk to Alex? Is that okay? Wait, I should point this way. Can I talk to Alex really Yeah, fast? sure. Talk, talk away. So Alex, when you're writing, like talking about vulnerability, like what what is the thing that is common for you to be scared of as a writer? Hmm, Alex is thinking. Yeah, I literally. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, honestly, like, I feel like first drafts for me are very easy. Oh. Like, just, and I'm, I don't, honestly. You said I, easy? I do. I feel like oh, hell yeah. drafts are really, like, easy. Wait, There's can no you say why it's easy? Because that's most people's problem. Like most storytellers have a problem with the first draft. I just feel like I'm like, the truth is no, it doesn't have to be in any way like architecturally sound. Yes! Same way right. that like when you're doing a first cold read of a play, it's like, you know, I mean, like it's like, you're just stabbing in the dark. Blindly feeling yeah, like, is exactly. this something? Yeah. And you're not like the onus isn't on making something so good. And I always feel like like the point that like stresses me out yeah. is like in, I mean, and I imagine this is common. It's like that two thirds, three quarters where you're like mm. bridge is like, it's kind of like built and I can like see it, but I don't know how on earth like this peg connects to this one, which mm. also is probably a product of the fact that just honestly, I don't, I don't outline drafts like I just like mm -hmm. write which is I don't know some people do it some people don't but like the like the downside of doing it that way is that it is like th two thirds three quarters of the way through you're like but where's this what going you get like Santa's trolley over <laughs> this hump and into the day you want rather than like being like oh like at the very beginning like you're just trading one out for the other essentially Alex I just see your character on a bridge that's not quite made and you're like can I leap over yeah literally <laughs> it's like what will, will yeah. I make it or will I fall like yeah Mario? that's what it always is is like and also just like I mean because the I mean, the more you get into the drafts, the less you like it because you get more Absolutely. sick of it. You're like, tired of it. Yeah. You're, yeah like, you're like, I'm bored of these jokes <laughs> and these poignant opinions. <laughs> it's really true. That's absolutely true. Oh I my like gosh. That. It's it's so true. And I and I feel like though when I get to that point now, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, I'm at that point where I hate it. So that means I've gotten so far, you know? Totally. And that is the way to like, look at it. It's just like, yeah, it's just like, probably like, darn. Stephen, Stephen King says he, he writes it until he's killed it. And then really? he's like, he sells the corpse. Right. Uh -huh. And I'm like, that's accurate. Right. That's like he accurate. no longer is interested. He, took all the life out of it and now he's giving it to everyone else. I'm like, enjoy. Okay. I got enjoy. <laughs> oh man, I I love that. Yeah, I think it I think that's so I mean obviously Stephen King knows what he's doing and oh yeah. knows what his but I also think that like everybody has to kind of find their own like phases that they go through and like like I mentioned, I know when I get to the point where I'm like sick of it that I've reached a certain level and I can be like, okay, I'm at this, I'm at the level where I'm sick of it. And now I have like these other levels to go until I can get to a place where I can actually like show this to people. And, but I think everybody has those own, their own phases and, and knowing your own phases is really helpful in your process. That way, when you get to the point where you hate it, you're not like, oh, well, I hate this. So I shouldn't work on it anymore. You but know? that's so 
interesting. I feel like, I, I don't know if it's everyone, but I definitely have that. And it sounds like you do too, Megan, um, that yeah. it's just you get really tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's natural to get, yeah. Like, get tired of it. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I mean, you, like, how could you not get tired of it? You're spending like all of this time in this world with these people. I mean, in, in real life, if you were spending this much time with real life people, you would get sick of them. And these people are in your head. So of course you're going to get sick of them. Yeah, they but you know what's great? Bars and restaurants all what? the time. Everywhere you go, you. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so this has been such a lovely conversation, um, but I, I am afraid we are going to have to wrap it up. Um, but uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for letting us share your story, um, for thank submitting you for it. Me on and this. Yeah, it was just just a pleasure to have the story and to to get to hear Jeff read it. It just added this whole other other level to it. So yeah, also thank you for having magical people here, like Alex. Oh, and oh my Jeff. God, no! Thank you for having me. This was so fun, Jeremy. It was so such a pleasure as always to read and hear your work. And Jeff was amazing. <laughs> so yeah. kudos I can't you. wait for your film. Yeah, hell yeah. I can't wait for it to come to LA so we can like I mean you have to you have to invite me. I wanna I wanna come yeah. see it. <laughs> Who else is on my mailing list? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh we all know that this is the not the last time that, that we'll see Alex and and she is going on to do um amazing bigger things. and and amazing things. And so we're just so happy that we got her on the show when she's available and um, can can make time out of her busy schedule for us. Well, thank you all. I'm glad to be here. So thank you. Yay. Um, yay. yay. Thank you, Alex. All right, bye. 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 All right, so that concludes another fantastic episode of Nobody Reads Short Stories. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You can find all of our previous episodes at nobodyreadshortstories.com. Watch all of our videos on YouTube. Please like and subscribe, as well as download. You can download our audio podcast from Stitcher, Google, Amazon, um, Apple Podcasts. Basically, anywhere you listen to your audio podcast, you can find us. So thank you so much, and we will see you guys soon. No one reads short stories anymore I really don't know what they're written for Go write a short story and throw it out the door Cause no one reads short stories Funny, sad, or gory No one reads short stories